Well, thank, thank you very much. I'm deeply honored. That was, uh, that's an amazing uh, experience to be up here and to be in front of all you. And uh, so I'm just kind of, I have to take a deep breath here. It's, uh, I'm kind of stunned. So um, I just wanted to, I guess I'll just have to take it in for a minute and think about it. <laughs> I've, I've never had a... <laughs> You don't get off that easy. I do have a speech. So. Uh, I just want to thank you very much for, for having me and for, uh, I mean, this is my first, I haven't gotten a, a degree since uh, I actually had to take finals, so. <laughs> it's much better this way, believe me. Uh, anyway, thank you very much for having me. I, I, uh, I, uh, I'm really not sure I deserve all the kind things that have been said about me lately. Uh, um, but it's, it's a great pleasure to be here at Colby and um, I'm deeply honored to receive the Elijah Parrish Lovejoy Award. Um, I don't think I deserve it, frankly, but I will try to live up to it. Um, this is my first time at Colby, uh, but I feel kind of like this is a second home because I've heard about it so often over the last few years from my editor and friend, Rebecca Corbett, uh, who's one of the finest editors in journalism working today, and I owe a great deal to her. And um, also, I've heard a lot about Colby from my colleague, Matt Apuzzo, who I think uh, anyone in journalism would tell you is one of the best young reporters in America. And he's uh, regaled me with a lot of his stories about Colby, and uh, including today, I got to see the the school newspaper offices, which look like every other school newspaper office I've ever been in. So, um, so anyway, I know it's a small sample size, but if you were, all your graduates are like Rebecca and Matt, then you're doing okay. Um, I also have a soft spot in my heart for Maine because I remember the first time I came to Maine when I was a little boy and um, my family was driving through Maine on vacation, and my father stopped the car in Augusta. I'm not, not quite sure why we stopped in Augusta, but um, my mother, who was very uh, curious about everything, um, decided that we should all go into the state capitol building. And um, at the time, it, I remember it was very empty, and we just started walking around. and. Um, there was this man walking around and my mother went up to him and, you know, as was her want, she should have been a reporter actually, she uh, just started buttonholing her, him and uh, saying, asking him all kinds of questions about where to go and what to see in the building. And he just decided to take us around. And after a few minutes we realized he was the governor. <laughs> it was uh, Kenneth, Kenneth Curtis. And um, he took us into his office, and um, he let me sit in his chair. And I don't know whether that meant he was a really nice guy or he was bored, or, uh, <laughs> but that was my first ever encounter with a politician. And um, as far as my experience with politicians go, it's, it's been all downhill ever since. <laughs> but I'm, uh, I'm really proud to receive this award because not only because of the legendary figures in journalism who've received it before, but because of its namesake, Elijah Lovejoy. I think as both a journalist and someone who likes to study American history, I've long considered Lovejoy to be one of my heroes. And um, today I think his story is particularly instructive because it can provide so many parallels to the challenges that we face today, both as journalists and citizens in the post-9-11 world. In fact, I would argue that, the press, that a study of the pressures that Lovejoy and other abolitionist writers and thinkers faced can help us step back and see more clearly what we are dealing with today in the post-9-11 world. Now, this may be the one audience in the United States that already knows a lot about Elijah Lovejoy, uh, but I'm going to talk about him anyway. Uh, he is really underappreciated 
in American history classes. I doubt very many uh, history students ever are asked to write term papers about him. But I think that's because he was such an early pioneer. Uh, he was a disruptive force. That's the language we would use today. Uh, and he, was, he became an abolitionist long before, decades before, abolitionism had any real impact in the broader society. And uh, long before the Civil War overshadowed such early pioneers as, as Lovejoy. After he graduated from what was then called Waterville College in 1826, he moved to St. Louis, then returned briefly to Princeton to study at a, theology, at a seminary, and became a minister in St. Louis. And as a minister, he decided to, write, to publish a religious newspaper called the St. Louis Observer. His hatred of, he started out as, as a religious publisher, but his hatred of slavery, which was all around him in St. Louis at the time, led him to begin to write about the need to abolish this institution in the 1830s. He was, and just sit, stand back and think about this, he was openly opposed to slavery, publishing articles opposed to slavery three decades before the Civil War. By doing so, he was committing the dangerous sin of challenging the conventional wisdom of his day. Missouri was a slave state. It's hard for us in the 21st century to get back into the mindset of antebellum America. But at the time, the acceptance of slavery as a legally protected institution was the mainstream view, not just in the South, but in the North as well. While there were political debates about how far into the new Western territories and states slavery should be allowed to extend, there was virtually no debate at the time in mainstream political circles about the outright abolition of slavery in the states in which it already existed. Remember, even in 1860, 30 years after Lovejoy, when Abraham Lincoln ran for president, he did not oppose or call for the abolition of slavery. His position was that slavery should be allowed to continue in the South. His argument, which was enough at the time, 30 years after Lovejoy was writing, enough to send the South to, sec to secession, is only to say that slavery should not be allowed to be extended into the West. So in the 1830s, when Elijah Lovejoy began to speak out against slavery in his newspaper, the mainstream press in America was never questioning slavery, and certainly not in Missouri, which had been the subject a decade earlier of a bitter congressional debate that led to the Missouri Congr uh, Compromise and which allowed slavery to exist, legally protected, in the state in which Lovejoy lived. When he was beginning to advocate for the freeing of the slaves, the abolitionist movement had not yet become a significant political force, certainly not what it became in the subsequent decades. And the handful of people in the country like Lovejoy who advocated for abolition were considered dangerous radicals, so out, far outside the mainstream of political and intellectual thought of, that, of their time that their mental stability was questioned. By calling for an end to slavery, they were challenging a bedrock political assumption of the United States. The American economy, both North and South, including merchants in Boston, as well as planters in South Carolina, were dependent on slavery either directly or indirectly, and so a basic prerequisite to being taken seriously in American politics of the time was to accept the continuation of state-supported slavery. To print a tax on slavery meant you were attacking the laws of the United States, and by publicly attacking the laws of the United States, you were nothing more than a criminal. And if you were a criminal, you were exposed to the whims of the crowd. In the 1830s, the conventional wisdom and support of slavery was just as strong in the North as in the South, and Elijah Lovejoy was not the only radical abolitionist facing danger. In 1838 in Philadelphia, an abolitionist building called Liberty Hall was burned down by a mob, 
and the city's fire department refused to put out the fire. In 1836, in Cincinnati, Ohio, a mob destroyed the printing presses of an abolitionist newspaper, triggering riots throughout the city for several days by pro-slavery mobs. Even religious groups, long considered to be progressive, were at the time fully supportive of slavery. In 1836, Sarah Grimke of Charleston, South Carolina, was rebuked by her Quaker community when she sought to discuss abolitionism in a Quaker meeting. So by challenging slavery in a slave state like Missouri, Elijah Lovejoy showed special courage. If it was dangerous to be an open abolitionist in the North in the 1830s, it was lethal to do so in a slave state. In fact, as late as the early 20th century, it's said that some school teachers in South Carolina made their students swear that they had never read Uncle Tom's Cabin. In 1836, his newspaper's presses, while well, he was still trying to publish in St. Louis, were wrecked by pro-slavery mobs in St. Louis. Elijah Lovejoy was at a crossroads. What should he do now? Should he continue down this path of openly challenging the conventional wisdom and the law of the land? Years before she wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, Harriet Beecher Stowe knew and respected Elijah Lovejoy. And it was her brother Edward, who was the head then of Illinois College, who encouraged Elijah Lovejoy to leave St. Louis and the pressures he was facing from the angry public and move across the Mississippi River to Alton, Illinois, so that he could continue to publish his abolitionist newspaper in a free state. In November 1837, Lovejoy was murdered by a pro-slavery mob in Alton while he was trying to protect his newspaper's new printing press. After he was killed, the mob broke his, broke his press into pieces and scattered them the pieces in the Mississippi River. Of course, we now know that Elijah Lovejoy was on the right side of history. In 1897, Alton, Illinois, erected a monument to him. But today, I think it's important to study Lovejoy and the other early abolitionist writers like William Lloyd Garrison and see what is really, what's really like to challenge the cement-like certainty of the conventional wisdom of the day, especially when it is constantly being reinforced by a mainstream press. Today, we have a wonderful glowing image of Elijah Lovejoy. But I would ask you to stop and think about our own times. Whatever your political persuasion or religious or cultural beliefs, think for a moment about the writer or blogger or television pundit or political activist that you hate the most. Somebody who really makes your blood boil every time you see them on television. Somebody you think is so outrageous in what they say that they must hate everything about contemporary American society. That's Elijah Lovejoy. I can very easily imagine Elijah Lovejoy engaging in bitter Twitter feuds with his adversaries today. It's difficult to recognize the limits a society places on accepted thought at the time it is doing it. When everyone accepts basic assumptions, they don't seem to be constraints on ideas. That truth often only reveals itself in hindsight. And so today, those who really challenge the basic assumptions of the modern American society are often considered just as dangerous, just as criminal as the abolitionists. The conventional wisdom of our day is the belief that we have had to change the nature of our society to accommodate the global war on terror. Incrementally over the last 13 years, Americans have easily accepted a transformation of their way of life because they have been told that it is necessary to keep them safe. Americans now slip off their shoes on command at airports, have accepted the secret targeted killings of other Americans without due process, have accepted the use of torture and the creation of secret offshore prisons, have accepted mass surveillance of their personal communications, and accepted the longest continual period of war in American history. Meanwhile, the government has eagerly prosecuted whistleblowers who try to bring any of the government's actions to light. Americans have accepted this new reality with hardly a murmur. 
Today, the basic prerequisite to being taken seriously in American politics is to accept the legitimacy of the new national security state that has been created since 9-11. The new basic American assumption is that there really is a need for a global war on terror. Anyone who doesn't accept that basic assumption is considered dangerous and maybe even a traitor. Today, the US government treats whistleblowers as criminals, much like Elijah Lovejoy, because they want to reveal uncomfortable truths about the government's actions. And the public and the mainstream press often accept and champion the government's approach, viewing whistleblowers as dangerous fringe characters because they are not willing to follow orders and remain silent. The crackdown on leaks by first the Bush administration and more aggressively by the Obama administration targeting both whistleblowers and journalists, has been designed to suppress the truth about the war on terror. This government campaign of censorship has come with the veneer of the law. Instead of mobs throwing printing presses into the Mississippi River, instead of the creation of the kind of enemies lists that President Richard Nixon kept, the Bush and Obama administrations have used the Department of Justice to do their bidding. But the effect is the same. The Attorney General of the United States has been turned into the nation's chief censorship officer. Whenever the White House or the intelligence community get angry about a story in the press, they turn to the Justice Department and the FBI and get them to start a criminal leak investigation to make sure everybody shuts up. What the White House wants to establish is our limits on accepted reporting on national security and on the war on terror. By launching criminal investigations of stories that are outside the mainstream coverage, they are trying to, in effect, build a pathway on which journalism can be conducted. Stay on the interstate highway of conventional wisdom with your journalism and you will have no problems. Try to get off and challenge basic assumptions and you will face punishment. Journalists have no choice but to fight back, because if they don't, they will become irrelevant. I know what Elijah Lovejoy would do. Thank you. Jim, when we say thank you for those remarks, we're saying thank you because you've spoken for us all. It's now an opportunity for people here at Colby and the Waterville community to ask questions of our Lovejoy recipient, uh, Dr. Risen. We have microphones here and at the center, so if you come uh, and we'll call upon you and uh, Jim will answer your questions. Who wants to start? Well, I'll start with a question, Jim. Day to day, what is your life like right now? Do you uh, make long-term plans? Do you buy green bananas? Are you worried, determined, a little bit of each? What's life daily like in the Ryzen house right now? I mean, in terms of my case? In terms of just your general life. Um, well, I... Uh, been trying to continue to work uh, while the government has uh, continued to come after me. Um, and it's, uh, to me, it, it's this case for, has gone on for so long now, uh, it's almost like background noise in my life. Um, people get, you know, it gets publicity every once in a while uh, because some event becomes public but I've had to deal with it privately, you know, for much longer. And so um, I've kind of gotten used to having, just trying to continue to do things um, without this uh, interfering. But every once in a while, the government intrudes, so. Uh, questions from the audience, anybody else? I can go on for a bit here while you form your questions. Uh, Jim, has there been any other period in American history uh, after World War I, perhaps, or after um, 
at the beginning of the Cold War where these kinds of threats to journalistic freedom and to free thought, free thought have been as prevalent as they are today? And if you had to rank the periods, certainly President Lincoln imposed severe restrictions on the press as well. If you had to rank where we are now, uh, given the technological differences of those times, how would you put us in historical perspective? That's a, good, that's a really good question. It's difficult to quantify the, the different er eras. Um, I think in the past, there was a distinction between wartime and peacetime um, relations between the press and the government. And the, one of the problems we now have is that this period of war now seems to be endless. Uh, we've got uh, wars going on or military operations going on in any number of uh, countries around the world. Uh, we've got, uh, and so we've never had a period where wartime censorship or quote wartime censorship uh, has been, has essentially been tried to be extended into uh, a peace, a largely peacetime society. And I think that's the difference between, say, the Civil War or World War II or World War I, where those were finite time periods. Now we're dealing with a far more indefinite uh, time period. Professor Maisel, you have a question? Thank you, David. I think the students are a little hesitant to come forward because they're still stunned by your lack of knowledge of the difference between Colby and Bates. So I <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll give them a second. Uh, earlier this afternoon, our distinguished alumna, Rebecca Corbett, talked about her impression of why, uh, as you characterized it, there have been more prosec prose prosecutions of journalists by this administration uh, and by an attorney general who many of us think of as a civil libertarian than there was by even the George W. Bush administration. I wonder if you could comment on two parts. First of all, Halder's role in this, and second of all, to the extent you know it, the President's role in, in continuing this, uh, not only your persecution, but others as well. Yeah, well, it's interesting because we've had these debates in the newsroom, uh, and I've disagreed uh, with other people in the office about this. Um, I don't think any of this would be happening under the Obama administration if Obama didn't want to do it. I, th I believe Barack Obama hates the press. I don't think he likes the press, and I think he doesn't like leaks. And after an administration does something repeatedly over many years, uh, you have to assume that it's because the president wants it to happen. And Eric Holder has one of his most important jobs in the Obama administration has been to protect Barack Obama from direct criticism. And, uh, He's, uh, he's often tried to do that on this issue. Uh, and I think that only, that cannot continue to hold weight after uh, you've been in office as long as they have. We have a question here. Doug. Thank you for your remarks today. Um, I had a question of curiosity, which is, um, it seems to me that the legal difficulties you've had have arisen out of you doing your job as a reporter. And when something like this happens, when you are prosecuted by the government, to what extent does the New York Times or any newspaper step in, and, 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 and to what extent is the newspaper there for its reporter when its reporter is being held to the fire the way you have been? Uh, well, my case is kind of unique because it involves a book that I wrote, um, so it's not the New York Times. Uh, but in general, when a, a story is written in the paper in which there's a leak investigation, the paper provides attorneys. In my case, my publisher, my book publisher, uh, helped with that. So uh, it's, but you know, the newspaper does back you up on these kind of things. The, um, Jim, the New York Times is different from all, almost all of the newspapers in having bureaus around the world and dealing daily with questions of national security. Is what you're up against, what we're all up against, just a matter of the big national papers, or does my paper, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, or the Waterville Sentinel, or the, Pittsburgh, or the uh, Portland Press-Herald, 
Do we have a stake in this, in this fight as well? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that's so f interesting about the way my, I mean, interesting to me, uh, the way my case is uh, <laughs> developed was this started out as uh, a leak investigation and every leak investigation is different. Everyone has its own peculiarities and set of facts. Uh, and it was going on for many years and kind of on an incremental basis. But um, a few years, uh, about a year or two ago, the Justice Department decided they had to appeal a decision by the court in my case in which, when the judge basically threw out the subpoena in my case. And the Justice Department appealed her decision to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. And in their brief, they turned my case into something very different from just a leak investigation. They filed a brief in which they said, not only do we think the judge was wrong on the merits of this case to throw out the subpoena, but we believe more generally that there is no such thing as a reporter's privilege in a criminal case in the United States. And so they turned a very specific case into a broad constitutional showdown between the press and the government. And for that's why I, uh, I appealed that decision by the Fourth Circuit in which, which they sided with the government. I appealed that to the Supreme Court this year and then uh, they, unfortunately they didn't take the case. And so the law of the land in the Fourth Circuit now is that no reporter has any right, any uh, right to the confidentiality of any source because the Fourth Circuit agreed with the government. And so that's a very dangerous precedent for reporters. And if it spreads to other uh, appellate court districts or regions, that will certainly affect all reporters everywhere. This, this is clearly a first name community uh, here. Uh, Matt, you want to go next? Oh, okay. Go ahead, sir. Um, so my question is about the media in general. We've talked a lot about the necessity for freedom of the press and the necessity for information to get out to the public when it's um, necessary in their lives. However, the world is becoming rapidly more global. How do you feel that this change um, has influenced the need for, um, for uh, confidentiality? Do you think it's made it less relevant or all the more necessary in society? I don't think it's had any effect on the need for confidentiality. The stories, our stories go further around the world because of the internet. Uh, more people hear and read what we write or say. Uh, but the only way we can ever get that information to begin with, to, to broadcast it globally, is to have confidential sources. And so, the basic information itself, the gathering of that information hasn't changed despite the dynamic changes in the dissemination of information. Uh, Matt, I think you owe it to us to identify yourself and your affiliation here, but go ahead. <laughs> um, it, Jim, do you accept the idea that in the national security world there ought to be some secrets, and how do you, how do you balance that? Um, uh, with the need to, to get information out to the public. Should there, should there not be some secrets uh, in, in, in keeping us safe? You should know that Matt and I work together at the New York Times. Uh, uh, so I know how he feels about this. Uh, of course, there are certain things that should be kept secret. I've often said that the best, the most important secret in today's world, in today's, uh, you know, the, in terms of the combat operations that the United States conducts, is something that we would never be able to print or find a way to get or want to print. And that is, like, where is the convoy in Afghanistan going to be in 10 minutes? 
which is the kind of information that if you're uh, in the Taliban, you would need to plant an IED. That's the kind of information that has no news value that we could never get to begin with because it's so perishable and so narrow. Uh, and it's something that is of, that would be valuable to the enemy and would actually harm American troops. I would argue that there's virtually nothing that's, been, that's come out in the press since in the whole war on terror that has in any way significantly damaged national security. And every time that the government cries wolf on this issue, they fail to be able to prove any real damage ever. And eventually they, many years later in many of these cases, they come out and admit, well, it really didn't cause any problems. And so I think it's one of these things that the government has gotten into the habit of crying wolf almost constantly. And they've lost a lot of the credibility on these issues. Uh, and it's one of the things I've tried to talk to people about the, in the government uh, over the years. I'm not one that they actually listen to, so. They don't listen, but they read you. Yes, sir. Um, you talked about the endless war, and this isn't just the U.S. It seems to be a problem for the entire Western world. The Oak Foundation brings to Waterville people who report and do things in countries where there, you could say there really is no freedom of the press. But that's not true, having lived there in many foreign countries, about other Western countries. They do have freedom of the press. So my question is, having this endless war, is the press under duress in other Western countries, and are they reporters facing similar difficult problems like yours, and do you know that? Yes, well, reporters in other countries, many other countries face much worse situations and conditions than I will ever face. Uh, many of them have to be, uh, are far more courageous, and they face uh, great dangers. But the thing that I would argue is that in the past, the United States was upheld around the world as a defender of the freedom of the press. And the fact that we, the United States, had a First Amendment and allowed for the free expression and, the, and an aggressive press was important part of America's uh, ability to influence the world. And now that the United States is cracking down on the press, I think that sends a message to dictators all over the world that it's okay to can crack down even more. And they know that they'll get away with it because the United States wants the shining example of free press is, is no longer going to you know, try to act like they're any better than, than they are. Yes, get to you, you next. Um, I'm a reporter, and every journalism conference I've been to this year has either had you as the panel or had a panel about you. And this issue is very, very much in the minds of journalists across the country of press freedom and what the prosecution of you means. I'd, I'd like to, though, I, I do worry that the public, there's this abstract term, freedom of the press, but they're not necessarily really deeply aware of what the cost is to the public of the prosecution of people like you, of journalists like you. So can you talk a little bit about what on the ground to real people it means if you can't do what you've done and if we can't do the kind of work that you do? Sure, I think it's very simple. If you look at the war on terror since 9-11, virtually everything that you now know about the war on terror it was originally classified. The, this is the first war we've ever fought that's classified. And there's, it's hard to imagine, it's hard to think back, but the, one of the, the only way we now know, for instance, I'll take a few examples here. The only way we know about the predator drone 
is because Cy Hirsch wrote about it in The New Yorker soon after 9-11. The only reason we know about secret prisons was because the Washington Post and other people wrote about them. The only reason we know about Abu Ghraib was because some whistleblowers brought out photos. There's virtually nothing in the whole history of the last 13 years that came out of an official government press release. It all came out through the press and through whistleblowers. And so if you go back and if you took away all of the things that the press revealed to begin with in the war on terror, you would know virtually nothing about the history of the last 13 years. And if you would rather live in a society in which you don't know anything, then that's, what, that's the alternative. Sir. Um, my name's John Bush, and I graduated 50 years ago, and the world was a very different place then. And despite the Fourth Circuit's decision, if you accept the privilege of some sort for the press, I'm curious what the press is today, because journalism has changed so dramatically, and people tweet stories, and they blog stories, and so on and so forth. So is there a domain that this privilege applies to, or does it apply generally to anybody that does anything publicly? Well, that's one of the, that's one of the big arguments facing people today as they try to think about the issue of a shield law or a reporter's privilege. No one's come up with a good solution that satisfies everyone about that. I think what you can, the best explanation that I've heard about it is that a journalist is someone who gathers and publishes information for public dissemination. Uh, and by public, I guess I would mean something more than just his Facebook friends. Uh, but even that would probably be up for debate. So, uh, but that's kind of, uh, I mean, I think you have to think about it in a very broad sense today of what is a journalist. You have a question back there? Yes, so you've talked a lot about the journalistic aspect of this, but something else that you highlighted in your speech was that we've gotten used to taking our shoes off at airports and um, you know, having calls listened to and things of that nature. And um, my question would be, you know, in previous wars, we've sacrificed different things, um, whether it's been along the lines of rations or drafts, um, people and food and so to what extent is sacrificing our right to privacy part of sacrificing for the war and our country? Well that was the government's argument that we have to sacrifice some of our civil liberties in the name of national security and the question is how long first of all the basic question is are we really at war? How many of you really feel like we're at war today? How many, and is there really any end to the war? Is it an unending war? Uh, is this a war like we fought in the past or not? Is this, are we bleeding the, is, is the period of war becoming some amorphous, endless period in which we can say we're, we can always say we're at war so that we can always limit our civil liberties? And those are the questions I think we have to be asking ourselves. Great. Yeah, so you, you talked a lot about uh, in your speech the, along the same lines, the state of the uh, free press and the First Amendment. Um, but a lot of what I struggle with is what uh, can just the average citizen do every day um, you know, small or large to sort of alleviate this process. Obviously, for most people, it's, um, you know, we don't write for the New York Times. We don't have these, these powers of the media. So, um, you know, how can we sort of, as active citizens, help to alleviate the, the road we're going down? 
That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I, I, all I can say is um, you have to read and stay informed. And uh, I think the more people actually stay engaged in current events and read uh, and listen to the news, that's the first thing. I mean, I, th I think um, one of the reasons the government has gotten away with what they've done is that there's so much apathy in our society. And um, I know I have three sons. Uh, one of them's a journalist and the other two aren't. <laughs> and they, <laughs> they have varying, varying habits of news uh, consumption. Uh, and so I always am encouraging them to read more and pay more attention to the news, and I think that's the first step. Jim, that's reminiscent of the fellow who said he knew two songs. One was Yankle, one was Yankee Doodle and the other wasn't. <laughs> uh, uh, the, um, the next questioner you should know, Jim, is the distinguished editor emeritus of the Kennebec Journal in <laughs> Augusta. Not so distinguished. Uh, what's the current status of your case What's the next step, and how do you think it's all going to come out? Uh, well, I can't really discuss my case, uh, and um, but it's uh, I don't. But I saying, having said that, I can say I don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, so, I'm going next. Yeah, Thomas Drake, NSA whistleblower and a source for the First Amendment. Uh, it's extraordinary privilege to be in front of you, Jim, because I know you have so exemplified what the First Amendment means as the foundational cornerstone of the Constitutional Republic. Here's my question on the Obama administration. More Americans have been charged with espionage for having allegedly disclosed national se state secrets to people not authorized to receive it. And as one who was charged myself, facing many, many decades in prison, there is no public interest defense when you're charged under the Espionage Act from 1917. How do we protect the sources that are so crucial in ensuring the livelihood of your practice in informing the public and providing the basis and the foundation to ensure the consent of the governed? It's a question I struggle with all the time, uh, and uh, there's no easy answer. And um, it's very difficult and painful, and um, to try to continue to do investigative reporting in an era in which uh, you know that stories you do could lead to leak investigations, um, and it's just something that is so important we can't stop doing it and yet we have to try to find ways to uh, always maintain the confidentiality of sources. We have time for uh, three more questions, you and you two there. So why don't you in the orange start, okay? Hello, um, this question isn't so uh, universal. Um, I'm an artist who uses writing to express fundamental concepts of the human experience. And um, I'm just, uh, I would like to hear more about the political side of your uh, journalism and your journey with uh, activism on your part. Um, I feel like a lot of times um, the uh, official um, positions inside of the government as well as um, private sector jobs are highly emphasized as the only modes of becoming involved with uh, maintaining freedoms in this country. So I just want to uh, hear about how you uh, came to be here after that one time in the uh, governor's office, which was quite <laughs> funny, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, you know, I've had a career as a reporter. Uh, I've tried to just be a professional reporter and by doing my job, I've kind of gotten thrown into this legal uh, situation. Um, and um, I, w I would much rather just go back to being a reporter and not uh, have to think about some of these issues. Hopefully we'll get back to a time when um, reporters are just reporting again. 
Go ahead, sir. Uh, you, uh, you've uh, talked a lot about how the government has uh, been essentially promoting uh, censorship through um, prosecutions like uh, like your own. Um, there, there's a story that I've been following for a while, but I think is, is uh, there's a movie coming out about it uh, in a couple of weeks about a reporter named Gary Webb, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with it, um, who, who reported on CIA activities back in the 90s, I believe, and he was, uh, he was uh, driven to, to kill himself uh, reportedly because of um, how he was completely ostracized by the journalistic uh, uh, community uh, and he couldn't get a job. So I'm wondering to, to what extent to, to, do, uh, do, do journalists and journalistic organizations also uh, can contribute to their own censorship? Um, I don't know. I think it's... Uh it's a competitive business, and so, um, and I think the internet has actually helped make it even more competitive. Uh, and so today, uh, I think you're seeing a much more transparent and open business in which, you know, while a lot of all the news organizations fight each other, um, it's much easier to get information out there than it used to be. Uh, and so I think that's, that's helped quite a bit. And for a final question. Uh, Jim, I know you can't discuss your case, but are you willing to go to jail rather than reveal your source or a very important source? Uh, well, I can't discuss my uh, case in any detail, but I, uh, as I've said, I would, uh, many times I will, uh, I would go to jail to protect the confidentiality of, uh, of sources uh, in any instance. We want to thank uh, all of you, and Jim Risen also. Uh, Jim, if um, your answers were so crisp, it makes me wonder if the Red Sox had a closer like you, they'd still be playing ball. <laughs> and to thank all of you who, by virtue of having come here tonight, have indicated your commitment and your devotion to the freedoms that we so cherish and to the work of Jim Risen that we so respect. And to thank all of you as well as Jim Risen for your commitment. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.